In class number three of the cross, the cross and the song of songs. Um, and interestingly enough, the copy of this book that I had, this this class, this, this chapter was missing. It just printed every page of the book, but this class. So I went to check the other books. They all had this class in them, and I thought, well, how strange that the book I, I'm using doesn't have this chapter in it. So the enemy may want us to skip this chapter, but we're going to go into this chapter. <laughs> it's a great one, and it goes along with last class, and, um, and I'm just excited to to be with the Lord and in the Word of God together and receive from his heart. So let's pray and jump in. Lord, we thank you for the class we just had. And of course, those in future generations won't know what we're talking about, but the Holy Spirit will. So that you are able, Holy Spirit, to minister the, the Lord in ways that are incredible. How you minister and how you do it in, in ways that are um, personal. But Lord, that's between you and each person. That's your work, God. And so we, we're we with you. Um, Father, I pray that you would minister the things that are in your heart, but that it would come straight from you, Lord, and that the Spirit of God would be able to reach people who are watching this video 10 years from now, and they'll go, how did they know that? <laughs> well, Lord, your Spirit is so beautiful, so precious, and so ever-present in the bringing forth of Christ in any heart of any time period on any piece of this planet that wants Jesus in a real way. So move for his sake to have that wife of the Lamb in real ways. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're in chapter 1. I think we're right around verse, well, if I put my glasses on, I'd know. <laughs> I think it's 4 or 5. Um, but let's read it. The, the name of this chapter is, I believe, Dark and Beautiful. Um, I don't have my book with me. I just printed the pages that were missing. And um, I think it's chapter 3, Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 5, first part, I am dark, but, or and, beautiful. There's so many translations of this, but that's the gist of it, I am dark and beautiful. Um, and what I'm going to do is just read a few of the, the paragraphs right from the book, because I feel like they really say some clear things. So, in Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 5, we find the Shulamite declaring that she is dark, yet also beautiful. Oftentimes, when someone speaks of their lack, they are filled with a sense of depression and failure. Yet with this lady, there is a sense of joy and even excitement. We hear the same tenor of heart in Paul when he says, I am crucified, and nevertheless Christ lives in me. That's Galatians 2.20. The phrase, I am dark, could be referring to the fact that there is no good thing in our old fleshly nature. Romans 7, chapter 7, verse 18. Many people see their own flesh as beautiful and godly, therefore finding no need for the beauty of Christ within. However, after a season of working hard for the Lord under the extreme heat of the sun, as we saw in Ecclesiastes, we begin to see that we are unable to fulfill the law of Christ and melt under the pressure. Even the things we thought were beautiful about us are found to be dark and wretched as we see the motives of that selfish old nature. The more we labor to be good and act correctly, the worse it gets. That's also Romans 7. When we try to be loving and kind, we find attitudes and motives within that are defiled and dark. Life outside of and under the sun has exposed the Shulamite's inward selfish motives. And we're going to go to Psalm 19 in a, in a little bit here. Next paragraph, she has found herself utterly corrupt as she sees the contrast between her life and the life of her groom. And remember the verses, I am dark but beautiful. This confrontation with who she is in herself as separate from him does not drive her into depression but presses her into him. Her focus is not on her lack but his fullness. She no longer clings to her own righteousness but chooses to embrace him as her life. Her beauty is now derived from another, just like that vine branch we were just talking about. She is no longer the source of her own virtues or her own beauty. Her darkness has not brought her into depression and self-loathing, but rather into the wonder 
of being found in him, the Son, who is all her righteousness. In a very real way, this crisis has caused her to, to relate to her beloved in oneness rather than as someone who is separate and living from their own resources. Okay, so that's just a lot of wording. Let's look at it a little closer. Um, I am dark and beautiful comes after verse 4 because it's verse 5. Let's take a peek. Who wants to take a little peek at verse? It's, that was maybe the most profound thing I'll ever share, Jason. Should I repeat that? So, and this is what makes a good teacher compared to an average teacher, statements like this. What makes this, this interesting is that it's, it's verse five, which I didn't even, I could said it so perfectly before. <laughs> it comes right after verse four. Because it's verse five. Because it's verse five. That's why they pay me the big bucks, people. <laughs> So let's look at verse 4, because it's going to be, there is going to be a spiritual thing that happens here, because of the word of God and not me. <laughs> Who wants to read the preceding verse to verse 5, which is the beloved verse 4? Do I have a contestant? Okay. Draw me after you, let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will exalt and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. I am very dark but lovely. Okay, you'll we'll stop at verse 4. That was, oh, that was, that nice. was great. Okay. That, that's an interesting verse because um, I'm going to read it so we can just have a second reading of that verse. But Chris did a great job. I just noticed. Let's just listen to the tenor of this fourth verse of the first chapter. Draw me. We will run after thee. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will be glad. We will be glad. We will rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. It sounds like a good day. I'm in the king's chambers. His love is better than life. I'm rejoicing. So where the heck does the next sentence come from? Would that be the next logical sentence? I am dark, but beautiful. I, I mean, this is the way the Holy Spirit was when I was taking the very small amount of time I had before class to look at this verse. Sometimes that's good because I don't have a lot of time to think it out in my own brain. It's just the Spirit just kind of goes like that, and I'm like, okay, that's what you want to say, let's go. In other words, the reason I am sharing it this way tonight is because when I sat down for the five minutes I had to prepare for class, he smacked me in the head and said this, and that's, that's the way I felt him wanting to share it. And he, and he specifically took me to verse four, like I am taking you now. This is what the Holy Spirit did to me. I'm just kind of redoing the, the thing he did to me, and he said, don't you find it interesting that there's this great time in his chambers and the next verse she's talking about what could be a real crisis, defending herself, trying to explain it. I mean, I don't know if that is the only, there's probably many ways the spirit lands upon that verse, but this is the way the dove landed on it tonight when I read it. And he was just kind of saying, that's an awkward next statement. Like I went to the store I found the deal of the day, the sun was shining, my favorite song came on the radio. Hey, I know I have a lot of problems, but you know, it's like, why do we have to go there right now? I just, we were just having a lovely conversation and you're bringing in your issues and then telling me that you're beautiful anyway. Wait, I don't get it. But, but the word of God isn't without context and spiritual flow from his heart, from what's going on really in the relationship with him. And so I said, well, Lord, what, what's going on here? And, um, and he landed on the word, he has brought me into his chambers. And that we had spoken of last time, his heart chambers, that he had begun to, you know, share his heart with her. You know, we talk about in Christ, we, we saw the circle on the board, which became a vine and a branch. In the Song of Songs, we had spoke of it as literally him beginning to share his heart with her in a way that was beyond teaching, imparting, you know, the things of his heart, his life. So there's, there's a union happening, right? The Song of Songs. 
the bridegroom to his bride is, you know, spoken of in this book. So why does it go from a chamber experience with the king, with the groom, to this, I am dark, I am, but I'm comely, but I'm beautiful. But, and the Lord directed me to Psalm 19. So let's go to Psalm 19. Kind of jumped right, right over to Psalm 19. I guess we can hold our place there, but I'm not sure we're going to go too much deeper in to the song than that verse tonight. But Psalm 19, now, this is where it gets fun. This is where it gets fun, and your assignment for this next three minutes is to find the word chamber as I read. Okay, here we go. Starting with verse 1 in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Well, that's pretty interesting. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the very ends of the world. In them he hath set a tabernacle. Oh, we are going to go a couple of verses down. Sorry about that. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. Beautiful. In the earth he has set a tabernacle for the sun. Take note of that. Next verse, verse 5. Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoicing as a strong man to run a race. Has anyone found the word of the day yet? In my, okay, all right, who knows where it is? Verse five. Verse five, let's read it. Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. What happened in verse five of chapter one of the Song of Songs? In chapter 1, verse 4. But we're looking at verse 5. Okay. Does verse 5 of the Song of Songs sound like an in-chamber verse? It really doesn't, does it? Well, I don't know if it is or isn't. I don't know if it's important that we get into the analytics of that. But I know this in my heart about him. That... He doesn't sit in that chamber all day. It, and now I'm not talking about being in Christ right now. I'm not talking about Christ being in us. I'm not talking about the true reality of our oneness through his death and resurrection. I'm speaking of his relating to us. I don't believe he just sits in that chamber and, and it's just better than wine and all this intimate fellowship. I mean, that's always there and that's a reality. I'm not even saying that. I'm only speaking on a dealing level right now where he doesn't at a certain point get up, if you will, if you will, from that chamber and start running. Who's running the race in this verse? And what's he called in this verse? The bridegroom is running as what? Oh, kind of a weak guy. <laughs> strong man. Why is he a strong man? Why is the bridegroom a strong man running? Why would a bridegroom run really strongly? To get a pet at the dog store? To get milk at the grocery store? To get his paycheck from work? The bridegroom would run strongly to get a... Yes, very good. <laughs> Amen. That's why they make me the teacher in the Bible school. <laughs> yeah, to get a, to get a bride. So, his, so he's going... So why... Would the guy who's in the chamber, they're having a wonderful, lovely time of communion. It's rejoicing and joyful and wine. And why would he get up from there and start running? Don't be spiritual, just be real. What? She, that could be, <laughs> very well could be. Absolutely, that's a great answer. Why else? He wants her to follow him. These are things of the heart, both of them. All that's heart stuff. Because a thought that came to me was maybe he, he's there and he's going, I need her in a way that just being in the chamber isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to do everything. Like there's, The chamber's right. It's, it's in the word of God. There's a season for it. It's, it's amen? It's, we're not against... The chamber time. <laughs> it's 
Wonderful, praise the Lord. But when the bridegroom gets up from the chamber Amen. and starts running to get a wife, the reality is he probably wasn't getting what he was hoping for in the chamber. He needed more. Otherwise, he would have stayed in the chamber. <laughs> so if a guy on his honeymoon starts running out of the honeymoon suite, you know, it's probably because it's time to, there's, there's something greater than what they have at that moment. And he's not going to, our groom isn't going to just lay back and go, well, you don't know, we had the ceremony. She is what she is. I'm stuck with her. <laughs> you know, I got to live with this. Jesus says, day it, I died to get a bride after my own kind, a wife for the lamb. And my heart won't stop till I make Jerusalem a praise. Jerusalem always representing the wife of the lamb, always. So he's like, I'm not going to stop until I brought her forth in my image. And I'm the head of the wife, and I am going to sanctify and wash her and cleanse her, and I'm going to bring her in. But even more than that, it's Psalm 19 speaks of another ministry of the bridegroom to the wife, which is incredible. And I'm going to move until she comes forth in my image, until my life is formed in her. Well, how many think that's a good thing? Would it feel like rejection if all of a sudden the groom <laughs> just took off like a running? And you could probably feel he's running away from you, right? You're like, I'm in the chamber. <laughs> Where are you going? I'm right here. He's like far away from there because you're never going to mature in chamberland. You need something called the hot scorching sun. <laughs> Hey, and I am being scriptural because it is in Psalm 19. And the Bible says bridegroom running, not Kelly morphing it into her class notes. It's in the word. So, so he's saying the chamber is good, but not when it's time for the sun to cleanse you and to pierce you. Oh, my goodness. This is good. Yes, Holy Spirit. Oh, these next verses are so phenomenal in comparison to what this says. It's amazing. Oh, Lord, you're so beautiful. So, so he's like, you know what? I am running for you, not away from you. It, Dagum, sure feels like you're running away. For sure. I'm pretty sure. In my feelings, I feel rejection. <laughs> he's going, rejection is leaving you like you are. That's a call in a... I'm sounding Italian, but it's me looking for words. It's called bastard in Hebrews. He who he scourges is not a son, but a bastard. He's like, I'm not going to leave you unconformed. I'm into bringing you in to my image, not leaving you outside the family. That's a good groom. A bad groom would be the lazy groom that doesn't run, right? He just kind of goes, well, whatever, too much work. This is too much work. I'm just going to cope. That's not our Jesus. He loves us too much. He knows we're his flesh and his bones, and he can't treat his flesh and bones as something that isn't him. He's got to bring us into who we are, already are in him. And that means he's going to get up and start running. How we understand that is, is our decision. But that's why the Lord has given us his word, and that's why... We have to probe, and even as Randy said, say, Lord, I'm blind. What are you really saying here? What is your word saying? Because I think I see, I don't see. I, I want to see what you're saying. I don't even want to see what you're saying. What are, what's going on inside of you? What's really happening in that verse? And what's happening in my story, in our relationship? Jesus, you and me, you and me. And then the Holy Spirit starts making it real starts breathing life into that. And I think that's what he's doing now. So let's go. Let's go with the strong man. Let's run with him. Let's keep going. Now we're in verse 6. Chapter 19, Psalm 19, verse 6. His going, who's going? The bridegroom. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. We may say glory to God. There's nothing hid from the heat of the bridegroom seeking a bride in his image. But do you know what that feels like in real time? These words, not very good. Not very good at all. 
How many people have ever tried to hide from the heat thereof? I'm going to raise both my hands and both my feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because until those not so tender rays start piercing your skin, you don't understand what real dealing is. But glory to God, this is the dealing of the bridegroom, not the great judge. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah for that. Go ahead. I hope I'm not like, jumping ahead, but just like back in the Probably are because you have the Holy Spirit. It's back in the Song of Songs, verse 6. It's like, don't look at me because I'm dark because the sun has like, looked at me. You are jumping ahead, and shame on you. <laughs> not really. I'm glad you're seeing it because it's beautiful when you see it. We're going there. Don't let me forget to, but let's keep going because it's going to be more impacting after we read this thing. But yeah, you're right there. It's the Lord. It's good. Okay, so back to nothing hid from the heat thereof, <laughs> lest we forget that this is not a pleasant experience, but it is a love experience. Yes, Deb? Um, I may have missed what you said about, did you say anything about the circuit? No, but I'd love to hear something about it. Yeah, I thought about how Pastor Stephen, he had like four or five churches. He would have a whole circuit that he would have to go to each church on Sunday and throughout the week and minister to them, take care of all those sheep. And this is saying that his circuit is unto the ends of the earth. Ooh, he's going for the bride. His circuit is unto the ends of the earth. He's seeking her. Oh, my God. It's, it's that just, is so good. Just, it's huge. It's huge. <laughs> his heart is huge. and it's, That it's, is huge. The scope of trying to find his circuit is not just coming by here in my heart and us, but that's amazing. That is, it shows that it's beautiful. His circuit is to the ends of the earth searching for that one after his kind. Those who would be of that all over the world. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Well, let's go to verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. Hold on there, Skippy. Like Randy says, Skippy. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. No, no, no. The law of the Lord is perfect. It makes sense in my brain. And when I have my special times of, of um, if I were a scholar smoking my pipe in the great library, so, oh, it's perfect. It's, one, it's wonderful. Puffy. Where is Professor Puffy when we, you know, I believe that this is many times would be thought of as a perfect statement for Puffy. Those of you who don't know Puffy, it's one of our puppets. He's a man with a puppet with a huge head, very little heart. Everything's knowledge, head knowledge. <laughs> so we call him Professor Puffy. And Professor Puffy would say, the law of the Lord is perfect. It makes perfect sense. It's just so intellectually pleasing, right? But the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That's a uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> That's your little spoiler alert that it isn't just going to tickle your brain cells. It's going to go into your gut and bring forth in Jesus. Converting the soul. There's a lot to be said, but even more to be experienced. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's continue. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Notice how these things are, that are always thought to be like doctrines and teachings and deeper life understandings. They're doing nothing to make us spiritual in that deeper knowledge way. They're changing us. They're converting our soul. They're making wise the simple. Because this is a bridegroom getting a wife, not, a, not a, a guru teaching spiritualites. It's a new word, a spiritualite. Don't be a spiritualite. Be a bride. <laughs> be a wife of the Lamb. Verse 8, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, well, that's a neat kind of sentence. Let's just read it again. The fear of the Lord is terrifying. Wait a second. My Bible, I missed my place. The fear of the Lord is clean. That's right. When you're in this with the groom, all of a sudden, that which used to be terrifying becomes clean because you see his heart in it and his love in it. Enduring forever. This is a neat. I will, what does it say in Hosea? I will betroth thee for what? Ever. Forever. What does Jeremiah say? I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Isn't that beautiful? Can you hear the heart of God in that? The heart of God in that. Yeah. I will be, 
Well, who was Hosea prophesying to? Israel, that was being likened unto? A harlot. And who was Jeremiah speaking to? And where were they on their way in that very verse? Babylon, because why? They were unfaithful, so he's not just commending the A-plus student. He's speaking to the people who are going to get their souls converted. And he's saying, by the way, I have loved you with an everlasting love. You need to remember that the next 70 years, because it will come in handy. Remember that. <laughs> Send that in the first letter, Jeremiah, right? Amen. These things are not just historical teachings with spiritual meaning. They are like God's sweet mercy in our lives right now. Take them that way. Make them your own because we need them. Hallelujah. This is how we get through it all. What does the Bible say the word of God is? A comfort, the comfort of the scriptures. Professor Puffy never learned that. He just got his big head tickled. But the bride who's with the groom in this way, she's getting comforted by the word because she's being brought into a oneness, real oneness with her groom. How awesome is that? Worth everything, worth it all. All right, let's continue. Let's continue. Let's read verse 9 again. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, Yes, even than much fine gold, sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb. Well, here we go. This is like some of that chamber talk again, but she is saying it about the dealing of the Lord now, not just about the wine and the, right? This is the dealing of the Lord, not the chamber land. Anyone can say that when they're in that beginning, just betrothal time. You know what I'm saying? That's easy. But when the fire starts coming, the dealings start dropping, the word starts reaching in, and then we begin to understand his heart and be with him in that process. Then we begin to say things like this, more to be desired are what? What is more to be desired? What's the context of that? Amen. Robert said it, the judgments. Now, come on now, let's get real. Who is going to say your judgments judging the fool out of my flesh, the heat thereof nothing in me can hide from? This is sweeter than gold and better than honey. Amen. Yes. I, Dad, I thought you were saying that was you, and amen. <laughs> this is David writing this. Yeah. Oh. Say it again. This is David writing this. He's not just writing something like David is writing this because it's something real. He knows the reality of this relationship and all the ramifications he's that's entering just, in. That's so good. That is his experience. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's powerful. That's so powerful. That's just amazing. This is his relationship. So if David can do that, and you think David got dealt with anybody? A bit. Just a little. Yeah. If David can do that, we can do that. Yeah. We can do that. Right now, right here, today. And then he continues on in verse 11. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, but in keeping them there's great reward. And, and listen to what, I love that y'all brought in David, because listen to what David says in verse 12, next verse. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from my secret faults. He's going, Lord, if you don't deal with me, what am I going to do? I can't even, I don't know. I don't understand my errors. I'm not even aware of them. In fact, I think I'm doing good. <laughs> That's always the crisis. I've, how many people have ever been just dealt with, pierced by the, the morning sun, and you're sitting there and you go, huh, you know, I thought I was doing good. <laughs> and like the law of the Lord, the word is just, is just judge. It's just opening the motives, the intents. It's just the word of God. It's like in Hebrews chapter 4, 3 or 4. You know, uh, what does it say? The word is like a two-edged sword dividing bone from marrow, joint from marrow, motive from intent. So, you know, we're just this double-edged sword and, and it's slicing and dicing and you're just going, I thought I was doing good. This is <laughs> discouraging. It's like a very poor choice of words for this. It's alarming and confusing and many other things. How is it that I, 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 I don't understand my error? Well, I'm sure David had been through that so many times that by this point he said, listen, who can understand his errors? I, I can't. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, Lord. 
So guess what? Cleanse me from secret faults. Cleanse me. Why? Because I want to be perfect. I want to be, we all know that's not David's heart. I want to be what you need me to be. So cleanse me for your need to have one after your kind. What, how beautiful is that? It almost sounds like chamber again, doesn't it? But how can it be chamber in the middle of the hottest sun beating on you and piercing you and exposing everything? Oh my Lord, we're the wilderness and there is no clouds. And how can we start talking that way there? Because we know his heart. We're with him. It's the bridegroom running after the bride. What does it feel like? It feels like we're a sinner in hell being sent to Gehenna or whatever. They, you know, our flesh is no. Remember the second baby that Gomer had, Lo Ruhama. What does it mean? No mercy, no pity on what? Our, let's say it the old school way, flesh. The flesh. No mercy, no pity. He said, great that you had Jezreel. Good to know that Jesus was sown and put away the sin, took care of the seed of Ahab, which was really Adam. Remember, we went through all that for a lot of time. But you need to have another little baby. In other words, another conception of what's going on at the cross. And that is that no mercy, no pity on your flesh. We're going to deal with this. You're going to go into the valley of Achor, the valley of trouble, and you're going to cry out. But you're going to find the door of faith. And you're going to start singing there instead of whining. It's chapter 2. Read it. I'm not making it up. Have this baby too. And all through that baby, contend with your mother. What does it say? Contend with her why. Deb did a skit on it. Because she's not my wife. Bridegroom talk. Contend with her. Say, you think you're my wife. You're not. You're not. You're not. No mercy. No pity. I'm going to get you there, though. But be with me right now in low Ruhama. Because if you are, there's a chapter 3, there's another baby, Luoami. And that's a picture of the lamb coming out of her. But you've got to go through baby number 2, Loruhama, the valley of trouble, the valley of Achor. Achor had all kinds of stuff he was hiding under his Babylonian garment, right? He had to be buried. He had to be put away. That's our flesh. So that the seed which is also in us can be brought forth, Loami, a picture of Christ crucified coming out of the same vessel, that was Gomer, the harlot, that saw Jezreel, the crucified bringer into death, that brought forth Lo Ruhama and had no mercy and no pity on her own flesh, went through the valley of Achor, got with God, and brought forth the lamb at the end of the day. Is it beautiful? And where does it say, I will betroth thee unto me forever? Lo Ami, right at the end of that Lo Ruhama. How beautiful is that? That's wow. When, that's when the, the Lord the appeared Lord to appeared. him. You know, and, and said, now, now you're going to bring forth the seed. That's so, a oh, whole man. There's so much heart significance in that scripture that you wouldn't see anything in unless you saw that person relating to the Lord in that way. That is so beautiful. Lord, we should just say, open our eyes to keep seeing you in the word in these ways. We just, we're blind, so be our eyes. Be our eyes all over again. 2020 vision, Lord. 2020 vision. Verse 13, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Just listen to his heart in verse 13. It is so beautiful. He's talking to the groom. Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be upright. I shall be innocent from the great transgression. He's crying out to the only one that matters. And the bridegroom's hearing his voice. Isn't that what we were talking about last class, that the Lord hears those cries? He even went to Sodom to check them out. So if I am a Sodom in myself, then I can cry out and God's going to come and check it out. <laughs> Amen. Is that cool? That's pretty darn cool. He's going to come check it out and see if there's a righteous man. And I'm going to say, there is one. It's your seed. He's here, stuck in the sod of me. And I'm crying out. If there be any presumptuous sin, don't let him have dominion over me. Bring forth your son. 
Amen. Me and David were crying it out together. And I love the last verse, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. And then he says it right, my strength and my redeemer. He, he's appealing to God's heart in so many ways you could spend hours on that verse. But let the words of my mouth, the meditation, he's saying let, let my inward parts didn't he say it in Psalm 51, possess my inward parts? Let my inward parts be possessed by your spirit and your nature, by the lamb, by the groom's spirit, so that you can look in the depths of my being and find your image, find your kind, at work, even in my meditations and my thoughts. But Lord, I'm not saying this because I'm going to do this for you. My strength, my redeemer, this is you in me. I can't ever, I am the Sodom, I am the transgressor. I am the, the barren, dry earth that is a wilderness. But your seed is in me, and you are my strength, and you are my redeemer. You are the groom. You are the life of this. And so I appeal to you in this way. And, um, and there we go. This is something that the Shulamite, back to the Song of Songs, needs to go through. But she can't go through this. She can't just say, okay, I'm going to get up and run the race. How many of us have ever tried to get up? and start running like a strong man. Who's running that race? The bridegroom. He's running. What is our place? To let the light pierce our, and what is, what is the verse? It's coming in the Song of Songs. Let's read it. Let's go to Song of Songs. Like many... Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. It's, it's, it's verse 6. It's a translation of verse 6. Let's go to the end. Uh, the, the second half, to be clear, to communicate slowly and clearly, I'm going to read all of Song of Songs, verse 6 from chapter 1. Look not upon me, because I am dark, because the sun hath looked upon me. Now, this is the next verse after I am dark but beautiful. She says this, and this is a perfect thing to say after what we have discussed in Psalm 19. Look not upon me, because I am dark, because the sun hath looked upon me. And this is another translation of this same verse. Will you disrobe me with your stares? The eyes of many morning suns have pierced my skin, and now I shine, black as the light before the dawn. Pierced my skin, to me, speaks of she has allowed that sun to bring a piercing, a true application of the cross into her for his seed, for his spirit to come forth in the way he needs. And she's declaring that process of Psalm 19. Many morning suns have pierced my skin. What does it say in the Psalm 19? I, I shouldn't have turned my place about the circuit of the sun and where is it? Now I gotta find it again. Psalm 19. I'm gonna have to turn there because I lost my place. But the Holy Spirit is having us go back, I think. Now, the heavens declare the glory of God, the permanent day. Day unto day, many morning suns uttereth his speech, and night unto night showeth night unto night showeth knowledge. Their line has gone out. I'm looking, I'm looking. Mm -hmm. It's right there. It's, a, it's that second verse. Day unto day. Day unto day. Many morning suns. His circuit, you know, is probably from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun. You know, in that sense, in one sense, one sense is, it's, it says it in Psalm 19, is the whole earth. But another part of the circuit of the sun is to rise in the morning and set in the evening. And then what comes after it sets? Another day, and what does the sun do? <laughs> right. And what happens in the, in the, in the course of the, the circuit of the sun in one 24-hour period? In the morning, it's kind of what? I love the sunrises in Arizona. They're gorgeous. You guys are from Arizona. They're beautiful. And the sun sets. <clears throat> but what's it like at high noon? Hot. Right. Arizona, it's the cooking stuff on the street. <laughs> They're cooking on the street. That's right in Arizona. So every day, we may have a little chamber time. But there's going to be a cooker if the Lord's going to get 
a wife after the lamb. He's going to cook our flesh, pierce us. Day after day, day after day, day after day, the cross comes to us from the Lord himself with the purpose of gaining us in the way he needs us. How beautiful is it that by verse 6, this Shulamite is on course for the real meal deal of his heart, not just for the spiritual thing that we think the Song of Songs about or being his church, his wife, his bride, his body, but the real meal deal where he is able to run like a strong man, to bring her forth in his image, to be like the hot high noon sun and pierce her with the heat where nothing can be hid. There's no shadows at high noon. There's no clouds. There's no way to avoid the sun at that moment. It's just going to get us. But that's what the word of God should do. That's what the word should do. It should be able to pierce us in, in a way like the sun who is the groom is reaching forth into our inward parts to number one, expose what isn't the sun. I am dark. Yes. Now, when he corrects me, I don't just go into the shock of, wow, I thought I was doing good, but yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. After a certain while, you kind of know, uh-huh, mm-hmm, yep, not the sun. But immediately go, but beautiful, why? Because he's bringing forth his life in me. That cross is piercing me, but not just piercing me to expose me, but to put away that flesh. I must decrease. It's, 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 this is the cross of my own death that's reaching into me, the cross that he already accomplished where he put me away, but it's reaching in and it's eradicating. It's releasing the dunamis and the power of that finished work into my real life inward parts, and it's radiating them. It's cutting them out. It's applied dunamis, applied power, applied cross power. It's radiating in through the sun, through his rays, his crucified rays that have already died but need to reach our earth and our inward parts. And they're burning it up with the altar fire of Calvary that's already done the work, but making it real in us so that why we might become. And it says it in the Song of Solomon. It's amazing. It says it in the amazing ways in order. And I love this. Hold on. i got to turn the page. I know it's right there. I know it's right there. Lord, I read it, and it's right there. I should just look at the Bible again, but I'm going to have to. And it's in order, too. Mm -hmm. Where is it that he's made me like? Oh, back to the Song of Solomon. Let me go to my Bible. Back to the Song of Solomon. I fire myself for not having it marked better in my Bible. All right. I'm black but comely. Oh, um, to hello. It's in verse 5. I am black but comely, dark but beautiful, all you daughters of Jerusalem, as what? The tents of Kedar. All right, now, 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 we've got something. I am not going to turn back to Psalm 19, but she's comparing herself to a tent. She's, she's, she's not saying I'm dark like, um, she could compare it to anything, but she's calling it a tent. The tent of Kedar was made from um, the dark wool of mountain goats. Mountain goats. It wasn't lambs. So she, she's saying, I may be a goat in myself. These, these, were we not talking about that with Ishmael last class? I may be the wild donkey. I may be the goat. I may be the Ishmael. But I want to bring forth the seed. Okay, so I am dark. My flesh, and you know what? It's been pierced by the sun, it's being pierced by the sun, and it's going to be removed because it is not the seed. But that doesn't bring me into depression or despair. I have it as a quote in I'm turning the page because I like this quote. She is liberated by her lack and driven into deep desire to be found in him, not having her own beauty, but shining with his. I am dark like a curtain of a tent. In fact, the tents of Kedar that are made with goat skins. Yeah, I'm dark. I am a goat. I am not the Christ. I am a wild donkey, but it ain't Jesus. Hello. Good morning. And let's get real. 
Have you lived with me for one minute? I have. I know the truth. Good morning. It's okay. We're all that. All flesh is flesh. Glory to God. Thank you for dying for all of us and as all of us, Jesus. But I am more than just a goat. I'm a tent for the king to dwell in. The king had looked upon me. As what? As a habitation. That's why the strong man was running in Psalm 19 to find a habitation in the earth. I will not turn back to Psalm 19 in my Bible, but it is in there. It is in there. He's running to find a habitation. A bride in which he can dwell by his nature. Okay, so I am dark. Guess what wineskins were made of back in the day? Jesus' day. Who knows what a wineskin's made of back in Jesus' day? Y'all know, don't you? Sheepskin? No, no, sir, not sheepskin. Goat's carcass. Mm-hmm. Little goat carcass. Hello. Figure it out. Do the math. Okay. Not a sheep carcass. When they were drinking their wine, they looked like they were drinking it right out of a goat. <laughs> Amen. And that tent of Kedar was not made with lamb wool, but goat wool. Yeah, I'm dark, but the king hath looked upon me as a habitation, and he's running like a strong man to get it. So good morning and hallelujah, I'm going to get on his side. I am going to run with the lamb in his pursuit of me. And I'm going to be liberated and not depressed by the process like David was in Psalm 19. Glory to God, let's do this. Amen? Well, we're in verse 6 of chapter 1 and she's already that deep in. (laughs) She's already that deep in. She's like, could we not have had two more verses in the chamber? Just two more. No. It would have ruined you. You've been ruined for life. You know what I mean? He knows what he's doing. He knows the timing. It's perfect. We don't think it's perfect. We think it's terrible. Terrible timing. I can't. It's bad. We don't know. We don't know. He knows. Just trust him. Once again, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. and He will make those paths straight. Don't lean to your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's how that scripture begins. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. He knows what he's doing. Trust him, period. Go to bed and stop thinking about it. Just be with the Lord. Amen. I'm just talking to myself. I don't know. Here I am. You know, I've got brain fog, Lyme's disease, mold toxins. I don't know. It just comes out. That's why God gave me to you. <laughs> I don't got enough mental to, to do it any other way. <laughs> oh, Lord. So let's pray. It's after nine, and my time is over. <laughs> it was over at Calvary. <laughs> so definitely over now. <laughs> oh, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the cross. Yes, we'll stop and begin there. <laughs> we need it. We want it. But we don't just want it because we loathe sin, and we're wretched, wretched, wretched. We want what your strong, running heart, beating, 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 moving with your circuit all the day, all the day after day, to get one after your kind. And Lord, that's in relation to us. That's why we're here. That's why the sun pierces. That's why we're going through what we're going through. So Lord, we want to get with you. And we thank you for bringing us the song of the cross and not just the dealing of the cross. There's this, uh, um, this is the, the cross in the song class. And yeah, the cross is there, but it's coming from the heart of the groom. And let us understand that in relation to our own lives and to one another, and to one another. So Father, we love you. Have your way, Lord Jesus. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for opening the word. Open our blind eyes every day. Give us your eyes. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thanks, guys.